Hello there, great person. Welcome to another science reaction. This time to the biggest star in the universe, size comparison, as requested. Having some fun with it. Short course Kozak video. I hope next week I will be able to do Melody Sheep. They are a bit longer and I need some energy for that because I have to think a lot there. But um, yeah, this one today. Hope you enjoy it. Let's see what they're talking about. And um, yeah. As always, um, I'm a quantum physicist, so I will do some physics commentary on this. I'm not an astrophysicist, so I might not know some things, but I will perhaps elaborate on stuff. And uh, perhaps you like that if you do consider liking and subscribing. And uh, I know many of you are, and uh, good to have you here. But let's yeah, let's just uh, get into this and let's see who the biggest stars are. And the the biggest one I know of is I think the size of the solar system or three times the size of the solar system but the clue is that he's not that dense so it's more like gas than solid or a plasma i mean stars a plasma but yeah the universe and why is it that large and what are stars anyway yeah what well, are stars things that would like to be stars we begin our journey with earth not to learn anything just to get a vague sense of scale the smallest things that have some star-like properties Jupiter. are large gas giants or sub-brown dwarfs. Like Jupiter, the most yeah. massive planet in the solar system. 11 times larger and 317 times more massive than Earth and more or less made of the same stuff as our Sun. I really like the red spot, by the way. Sorry, this is a bit off topic, but this is just, you know, this is a hurricane, it's a storm, and you know, see the Earth, it's bigger than the Earth. I like that so much. When I was young, I was so fascinated by that. And yeah, there's, uh, it's about 70% hydrogen, so it has star-like properties. Just much, much less of it. The transition towards stars begins with brown dwarfs, failed stars that are a huge disappointment to their mums. Aww. They have between 13 and 90 times the mass of Jupiter. So even if we took 90 Jupiters and threw them at each other, although fun to watch, it wouldn't be enough to create a star. But you have to consider it's um, the uh, cubic, so power of three. That so wouldn't be like, what was that? It's like uh, four times the, 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 the diameter, I think. Does that fit? I think it fits. I would have to calculate whether it's like four or five or six times the diameter of Jupiter and then it already would ignite, I think. But good that we know it. I mean, I, I asked it the last video, so I didn't know. So we could calculate it here, but we're not going to do that because we want to have fun and yeah. That's cool. Adding lots of mass to a brown dwarf doesn't make it much bigger, just it's insides denser. Yeah. This increases the pressure in the core enough to make certain nuclear fusion reactions happen slowly. Uh, and the object yeah, so I was wrong. So brown dwarfs it's are not the size, gas it's the density. I mean, that makes sense. Any category very well. But we want to talk about stars, not failed wannabe stars, so let's move on. Main sequence stars. Once large gas balls pass a certain mass threshold, their cores become hot and dense enough to ignite. Yep. Hydrogen is fused to helium in their cores, releasing tremendous amounts of energy. Stars that do that are called main sequence stars. Yeah. The more massive a main sequence star is, the hotter and brighter it burns and the shorter its life is. Once the hydrogen burning phase is over, stars grow. Yeah. Up to hundreds of thousands of times their original size. But these giant phases that <laughs> only last for a fraction of their lifespan. So we'll be comparing stars at drastically different stages in their lives. This doesn't make them less impressive, but maybe it's good to keep in mind that we'll be comparing babies to adults. Now yeah. back to the beginning. The smallest real stars are red dwarfs, about 100 times the mass of Jupiter, barely massive enough to fuse hydrogen to helium. Because yeah. they are not very massive, they are small, not very hot, and shine pretty dimly. They are the only stars in the main sequence that don't grow once they die, but sort of fizzle out. Poor things. Red dwarfs are by far the most abundant type in the universe. Because they burn their fuel very slowly, it lasts them up to 10 trillion years, a thousand times the current age of the universe. For example, one of the closest stars to Earth is a red dwarf star, Barnard star, that yeah. shines too dimly to be seen without a telescope. 
We made a whole video on red dwarfs if you want to learn more. Yeah. The next stage are stars like our sun. To also, the thing with the, the lifetime, that's, I think, a pretty typical misconception. So that you have, like, if it's bigger, it obviously lives longer. No, it's not like that. Say the sun dominates the solar system is not doing it justice since it makes up 99.86% of all its mass. It burns far hotter and brighter than red dwarfs, yeah. which reduces its lifetime to about 10 billion years. The sun is seven times more massive than Barnard's star, but that makes it nearly 300 times brighter with twice its surface temperature. Let's go bigger. Yeah, let's go bigger. Small changes in mass produce enormous changes in a main sequence star's brightness. The brightest star in the night sky, Sirius, is two solar masses with a radius 1.7 times that of the sun but its surface is nearly 10,000 degrees celsius making it shine 25 times brighter burning the sun that is hot 7, reduces its total lifespan by four times to 2.5 billion years yeah stars close to 10 times the mass of our sun have surface temperatures near 25,000 degrees celsius Beta Centauri contains two of these massive stars, each shining with about 20,000 times the power of the Sun. That's a lot of power coming from something only 13 times larger, but they'll only burn for about 20 million years. In it's so generations interesting, of these yeah. stars die in the time it takes the Sun to orbit the galaxy once. So is this the formula? The more massive, the larger the star. The most massive star that we know is R136A1. It has 315 solar masses and is nearly 9 million times brighter than the sun. Yeah. And yet, despite its tremendous mass and power, it's barely 30 times the size of the sun. The star is so extreme and barely held together by gravity that it loses 321,000 billion tons of material through its stellar wind every single second. That's a lot. Stars of this sort are extremely rare because they break the rules of star formation a tiny bit. <laughs> when supermassive stars are born, they burn extremely hot and bright, and this blows away any extra gas that could make them more massive. So the mass limit for such a star is around 150 times the sun. Stars like R136A1 are probably formed through the merger of several high-mass stars in dense star-forming regions and burn their core hydrogen. That's interesting. I didn't know years. this. So this means they are rare and short-lived. How short-lived? From though? here, the trick to going bigger isn't adding more mass. To make the biggest stars, we have to kill them. Yeah. Red giants. When main sequence stars begin to exhaust the hydrogen in their core, they contract, helium. making it hotter and denser. This leads to hotter and faster fusion, which pushes back against gravity and makes the outer layers swell in a giant phase. And these stars become truly giant indeed. For example, Gakrux. Only 30% more massive than the sun, it has swollen to about 84 times its radius. Yeah, look, the sun Still, is down when there. when the sun enters <laughs> the last stage of its life, it will swell and become even bigger. 200 times its current radius. In this final phase of its life, it will swallow the inner planets. Yeah. And if you think that's impressive, let's finally introduce the largest stars in the universe. By that time we might um, actually be, if we still exist as anything recognizable or intelligent, we'll probably be on Europa, I think, and one of Jupiter's moons, because it's hotter there then, and yeah. Hypergiants. But yeah, I think they found, by the way, I think they found uh, nan nano uh, warp bubbles. They created them. I don't know if it's peer-reviewed yet, but they are making so much progress with warp technology, so who knows who are, where we will be in 100 or thousand years we might already be amongst the stars hypergiants are the giant phase of the most massive stars in the universe they have an enormous surface area that can radiate an insane amount of light being so large they're basically blowing themselves apart that's so beautiful As gravity at the surface is too weak to hold on to the hot mass which is lifted away in powerful stellar winds Pistol star is 25 solar masses, but 300 times the radius of the sun, a blue hypergiant aptly named for its energetic blue starlight. 
It's hard to say exactly how long Pistol Star will live, but probably just a few million years. Yeah. Even larger than the blue hypergiants are the yellow hypergiants. The most well studied is Ro Cassiopeia, a star so bright it can be seen with the Doesn't naked play eye League of Legends, so does he? of light years from Earth. At 40 solar masses, this star is around 500 times the radius of the Sun and 500,000 times brighter. If the Earth were as close to Rho Cassiopeia as it is to the Sun, it'd be inside it and you would be very dead. <laughs> Isn't that always how this ends? Are very rare, though. Only 15 are known. Yeah. This means they're likely just a short lived intermediate state as a star grows or shrinks between other phases of hypergiantness. With red hypergiants, we reach the largest stars known yeah. to us, probably the largest stars even possible. So, who's the winner of this insane contest? Oh, I knew the name was. Well, the truth is, we don't know. Red hypergiants are extremely bright and far away, which means that even tiny uncertainties in our measurements can give us a huge margin of error for their size. That is so important. Um, if you measure the night sky, there are, you know, normally you have error bars, you know, the error bars that show you where your measurement is between in, I don't know, a certain probability. And um, if you measure them and they are, the farther they are, the, way, the more you get an error. If, like if it's one centimeter of error that you measure by looking and it's, I don't know, two light years away, that's not that much. But if it's 100,000 light years away, I mean, what is that? I mean, imagine that what the error is. So yeah, it's so hard to measure this. Um, yeah. So I re I'm really glad that he brought this up. Worse still, red hypergiants are solar system sized behemoths that yeah. are blowing themselves apart, which yeah. makes them harder to measure. As we do more science and our instruments improve, whatever the largest star is will change. The star that is currently thought to be among the largest we've found is Stevenson 218. Oh, that's not it the was name I remember. Born as a main sequence star a few tens of times the mass of the Sun and has likely lost about half its mass by now. While typical red hypergiants are 1,500 times the size of the Sun, the largest rough estimate places Stevenson 218 at 2,150 solar radii, so much. shining with almost half a million times the power of the Sun. By comparison, the Sun seems like a grain of dust. <laughs> yeah. Our brains don't really have a way of grasping this kind of scale. Even at light speed, it would take you 8.7 hours to travel around it once. Oh no, what have you done to the photon? Oh god, she was so good at... I'm sorry, this is just my pet peeve, I hate... You know I hate if they visualize photons like this, it's rubbish. Photons do not have a... Um, if... Photons don't have a localization, they don't. I mean, the only way to localize a photon is by measuring it and that it, absorbs it, that it absorbs it and destroys it. So, you know, it's irrelevant to think about it. So this picture... No, mate. No. The fastest plane on Earth would take around 500 years. Dropped on the Sun, it would fill Saturn's orbit. As it evolves, it will probably shed even more mass and shrink down into another hotter hypergiant phase, accumulate heavy elements in its core, before finally exploding in a core collapse supernova, yeah. giving its gas back to the galaxy. This gas will then go on to form another generation of stars of all sizes, yes. starting the cycle of birth and death again to light up our universe. Let's make this journey again, but this time without the talking. The universe is big. There are many large things in it. Yeah. Now, this is not as um, interesting. It is interesting, but it's not as interesting as the black holes because I like black holes more. But yeah, they are, this is more beautiful because uh, they're doing a good job at animating it. They're, they've come so far, it's so good. Yeah. That's, I mean, look at the If thing. you want to play a bit more with size stuff. Yeah. I like this. This was, thanks for the recommendation. That was a good one. I especially, so the best part of the video was um, when he talked about the measurement uncertainties because that's really a thing. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm working with a planetarium and they uh, have the universe cartographed and they can project it onto the um, dome, you know, like they do. 
and um, that's not where the stars are. That's where they might be. So and they you can uh, they have this tool and you can actually put in the uncertainties so the stars get these circles around them. So where you know where they might also be and it's like the whole sky is full of circles. It's just amazing to see that. Yeah, and uh, the, the only part I didn't like was the photon. It's like, uh, why not Why not put a little man that has like photon written on him or the uh, gamma and let him fly around. Everyone knows it's not like how it is. It's just, you know, that's my pet peeve. But other than that, great video. Very, very much enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, next week I will probably do Melody Sheep and uh, let's see where it goes. And uh, I hope you have a great day and great evening and see you soon. Bye.